Body cam footage there of defendant Leon Jacob being hauled off to jail. And boy, does he like to talk. We're going to bring a very special guest into this discussion. I have more uh, pleasure introducing this guest than any other guest I've introduced here on the Law and Crime Network. It is none other than Jesse Weber. Ladies and gentlemen, here he is. Thank you. Notice that when he's my guest, he doesn't even go through the trouble to don a tie. You know what it is, Aaron? Your presence takes up so much of the camera. I don't need blah, blah. the tie. Well, it's a pleasure to be your guest here today. So what do you, So let's talk about Leon Jacob here. What's up with this guy? This guy likes to talk. He just starts spilling his guts about a detailed uh, docket of everything that he does this day. And why does he do that? He wasn't asked about his whereabouts. I'm Guilty conscience. I'm surprised that he didn't just take out a note and say, "Here's I'm, I'm so hurt. Here's what I did between the hours of 6 a.m. and midnight. I mean, he had a prepared alibi ready. He just kept talking, he just kept talking, and he just kept talking. So when the jury looks at that, they see a guy who's very suspicious here. Automatically, his first instance is to tell the officers where he was. He wasn't even a suspect yet. A normal reaction would have been so overtaken with grief and, and trying to understand what's happening. And maybe first ask, what happened to her ex? How did this all happen? What? Confusion. But no, he's prepared with a statement about what he did. Very suspicious. Yeah, okay. And, and her reaction, okay, his new girlfriend's reaction to learning about this uh, purported death, because that's the way police played it. They played it as if this actually was carried out. Okay. Is that acting or was it a legitimate reaction? How many times do we see these kinds of sting operations? We saw it in Dahlia de Polito. We see it all the time. We try to analyze what are people really thinking. And here, when if you just look at the reaction, you might say to yourself, okay, everybody reacts differently. We covered other cases. We covered Tex MacGyver, right? Try to understand his reaction to what happened to his wife. But here, when you combine it with the unusual circumstances, and especially with this Leon Jacob character, you start looking at it and say, this is not normal yeah, behavior. Yeah, this, this is a little bit strange. I mean, uh, that's the way I took it. And, and, and I hate to sort of armchair quarterback it because we know the full story. Right. And judging it, knowing all the facts that we know, is a little bit, uh, a, a little bit tricky. But uh, look, we're going to come back with a little bit more analysis of this. We want to play a little bit more of the testimony from that undercover officer whose uh, face uh, was not shown on camera. Uh, we're going to listen to a little bit more of that and be back with a little bit more analysis in a moment. Here are today's top crime stories trending on lawandcrime.com and across the country. The body of a dead fetus was discovered on a commercial airplane at LaGuardia Airport in New York City. Authorities say the fetus was discovered on an American Airlines Airbus A321 plane, which was last used on Monday night for a flight from Charlotte, North Carolina to New York City. The plane's cleaning crew reportedly found the fetus inside the airplane's bathroom in the toilet. The fetus is believed to be five or six months old. The nail salon in New York City, where this violent melee took place, remains closed after protests forced it to shutter. The wild brawl reportedly started at New Red Apple Nails in Brooklyn when a customer refused to pay after she accused a worker of messing up her eyebrow. <laughs> customer Christina Thomas and nail salon employee Hu Yu Zhang were both arrested and have been released from police custody. The video sparked protests due to the racial nature of the attack. Convicted sex offender Bill Cosby is asking a judge to dismiss a defamation lawsuit filed against him because his accuser is a public figure and not a private citizen. Actress Catherine McKee accused Cosby of sexually assaulting her in 1974, and when Cosby called her a liar, she filed a civil suit against a disgraced comedian. Cosby, who's been accused of sexual misconduct by over 60 women, was convicted of sexually assaulting Andrea Constant at his home in Pennsylvania in 2004. Cosby could face up to 30 years in prison when sentenced in September. Those were today's top crime stories. I'm Anthony Velez for Law and Crime. All right, let's talk a little bit about this Bill Cosby case. And for that, we have our very own Jesse Weber, who's a little disoriented because he's on the other side of the desk right now. I, I got to tell you, the morning host chair looks good on you. It does. I don't uh, like to I don't say know. It. I, th I think you like to get up early and come in here first thing in the morning. So Bill Cosby, though, he's trying to say, hey, wait a minute, um, I'm famous, but you're famous. And he's trying to use that as a shield from a defamation lawsuit from one of his purported victims against him. 
Right. It's interesting. So under the law, if you're a public figure, if you're a celebrity, there is a much higher standard to get a successful defamation lawsuit as, as if opposed to if you were a private individual. Now, this is where it becomes really interesting. If I mention the plaintiff's name, Catherine McKee, how many people know who that is, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you could say she is a public figure because she has access to the media. She is putting herself out there and saying... Uh, she's accusing Bill Cosby. She is, has that platform. Maybe that's what makes her a public figure. But the, really, the Supreme Court is going to have to ultimately determine what makes someone a public figure. And I think today is a really interesting time to do it, especially with social media and having access. What makes someone public today? And, and, and that is a really interesting legal development because whatever they decide will have not only implications for this case, but any kind of defamation uh, in the future with celebrities. Yeah, you know, you know, who is a public figure? The old standard used to be, is it someone who basically has access to the press to defend him or herself? Right. Okay. And if and if you're famous and anybody can pick up what you have to say, there's a higher bar uh, for such a person to um, successfully press a defamation claim, because in theory they could just go out and say, "Hey, look, this person who's saying this about me, this isn't true," and it would get picked up and carried. But as you say, these days, I mean, anybody can send out a tweet. Here's the other way of looking at it. They were protected, let me phrase, private individuals were protected because they didn't have access to really defend themselves against these claims. But the public, if you're a public figure, if you're a celebrity, you take the bad press with the good press. The flip side of it is, with McKee, you could say she became so famous through all this, not through any fault of her own, she's claiming that she was sexually assaulted by Bill Cosby. That's what's making her a claim to fame. Yes, she was an actress. Yes, she had access to different television shows. But really, what's putting her in the public light is something that she didn't want to bring her to the public light. And I think that's a very interesting argument for her team to say, you want to call me a public figure? I didn't ask for this. I'm not a general public figure like President Donald Trump or Bill Cosby or anybody who tries to get into these defamation suits. I was brought into this for something of not my, not my own volition, and maybe that's the argument she should phrase. At the end of the day, she's going to want to say she's as private as, pub, as possible because the standard would be negligence as opposed to showing actual uh, knowledge of this false claim. It's a, high, it's a lower standard. Look, it still sets up an interesting case because ultimately it's a he said, she said back and forth between Cosby and this purported victim. How do we litigate the truth of the matter? I mean, that's part of defamation law as well. We could keep going around and around about it, but look, we want to switch back, folks, to the Leon Jacob case. We're going to listen now to a paralegal who was caught up in this whole mess, Laura Thurlow. She basically had some connection with the alleged hitman. She was tied up in this, uh, in, 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 and we're going to listen to some of her testimony now. All right, we're going to pull out of that clip a little bit earlier to sort of break down what happened. Jesse, this is really critical stuff. Leon Jacobs is asking her to, to get him back together with his ex, and if that doesn't work, to get his ex out of town, and if that doesn't work, to inject her with a syringe. You know what I love Who about asks this? the bail bond people to do that? You know what I love about this guy? He won't do anything himself. He tries to get the bail bondsman to help him out. He tries to get Motaz. He tries to get Laura. He'll do anything to get someone else to do it. And to see so naive to think that this wouldn't happen, that these people that he tried to solicit wouldn't come back in court one day and testify against him, I find this ridiculous. But he's always going after other people to get what he wants done. Yeah, thinking that he can somehow deflect it, perhaps, and say, oh, I wasn't doing any of this. It was this person. It was that person. I mean, apparently no concept of criminal justice. Right. And like he said to the officers when they came into the apartment, oh, I was... I was here all day. I didn't. I personally didn't do anything. And by the Mr. way, I, I got up and got a snack at 11:01 yeah. and went to the bathroom at 11:15, sort of thing. <laughs> I mean, he had his whole day all lined up yeah. for them. Why? I mean, I can't remember half what I did this morning. But he knew everything. Look, of consciousness course. of guilt, possibly. We'll be back with more on the Leon Jacob case in just a second here on the Law and Crime Network. We're going to continue to break down that testimony from the paralegal when we return. Wow, more crazy testimony from that paralegal who was wrapped up in this murder-for-hire case in the Houston, Texas area. Jesse Weber is here to break it down. And Jesse, we, we heard a little bit more there, so, so let's talk about why she's involved in this. She was involved with this aggravated stalking and intimidation case that the ex filed against Leon Jacob, and he's trying to get her out of the way in any way possible, as she just said. Isn't it funny that he's trying to get himself out of trouble with the law by committing another crime? So, I listen, I don't want to lose my, uh, my, uh, my medical license. I don't want to be, lose that opportunity because of these aggravated stalking charges. So the best way to do that is, hmm, can I get rid of Megan? Maybe I can do that by trying to get rid of her. Yeah, that 
That's the way to do it. That, that's, that makes per perfect sense, I guess. I mean, look, I mean, should they teach law school along with med school? In this case, they should. And you know what it is? This isn't a situation about someone who thinks they're above the law. This is somebody who really thinks he's above everybody else. And I think that's really what's interesting here. He thought he could get away with this. Now, the question becomes, trying to get into his mindset, did he really want to kill Megan? Or was he just trying to get her out of the picture, get her to P Pittsburgh, somewhere out of a the state? A defense States? theory and, you know, certainly a prosecution theory, though. But, but I agree. And it's interesting, Jesse, how much more opinionated you come when you're on the other side of the table. It's nice here. I like it on this side. <laughs> you, I can you, can, you can sit over there and, uh, and, and come up with more and more things to say. But look, we're going to take a break here on the Law and Crime Network. We'll be back with more of uh, Jesse's analysis, my analysis of the Leon Jacob murder for hire case out of Houston, Texas, when we return here on the Law and Crime Network. Welcome back yet again, folks. We were listening to more testimony from that paralegal in the Leon, uh, the, the, I'm losing my thought train here, Jesse. You've distracted me yet again. Leon Jacob trial. And her connection basically is, uh, look, Leon Jacob knew her through this aggravated stalking incident he was afraid about losing his medical license, so she, he's asking this paralegal to help get his ex-girlfriend out of the way. He was persistent. He was very, very persistent, apparently. So she's a strong witness for a lot of different ways, but I love the idea that now the jury is hearing this and saying, okay, if he was already trying to stalk this paralegal, then isn't it true those other charges that Leon Jacob was basically implicated in a connection with that he was trying to stalk his ex-girlfriend and if they start believing these things that is it so hard to believe that okay maybe he took a step further and really did have these conversations with multiple people to try to get rid of megan so it's again one of these uh, situations where if it shows a pattern it's not just one instance not just one witness but multiple times it's starting to sound more real as he's not taking the hint to, bed, to, to back down. He's not taking the hint, okay, this proceeding is occurring, the stalking proceeding. He's not taking the hint that he better back off. He's trying to meddle through this person, meddle through the hitman. Again, a pattern lining up, and, and bit by bit, uh, the, the presumption is that, that maybe he is indeed guilty of this. But look, we're going to continue our review of the Leon Jacob case when we come back in just a moment here on the Law and Crime Network. The case of a med school grad accused of hiring a hitman to take out his ex. His new girlfriend got involved with it as well, also asking for a hit. We'll return in just a moment. That's testimony from a paralegal in the Leon Jacob murder for hire case out of Houston, Texas. And she was drawn into this because she was involved with an earlier case between Leon Jacob and his ex-girlfriend, Megan Veracaz. Megan was asking basically for uh, legal protection against Leon Jacob in an aggravated stalking and intimidation case. This paralegal was wrapped up in that and in the process of it, Leon Jacob basically said, can you help get her out of town? She needs to get out of town. She needs to possibly be injected with a syringe that I can provide because I have medical training to help incapacitate her so that she can be carted out of town so she can't testify against me and jeopardize my medical license. That's how this whole thing started. Jesse Weber is here with me to break it down. This is just bizarre, bizarre, bizarre because it starts with some bad stuff and then it gets worse and then from getting her out of town, it allegedly then goes to murder for hire, just get rid of her completely, just erase her. But the defense is trying to say, no, 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 it never went that far. He just wanted her out of town to prevent her from testifying. You know, that's the interesting part about this case, right? How far are we supposed to believe that this man went before he said, oh, I don't want any violence to come to her. I just want her to leave town. I These words like taking her out, terminating, eliminating, when you hear me on the recorded conversation with uh, Motaz and this undercover police officer, I, I never said those words. I never intended for her to get killed. But I how, just said them with no yeah, intent. I, I, I did everything in my power to get people who are involved in the hit, the hitman business. Okay, people who kill people. I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to have these conversations. But whoa, 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 I never gave them the green light to do anything like that. A jury is not stupid as much as Mr. Uh, Jacob, Jacob might so, like, yeah. like to believe everybody is stupid. Now, again, the question is, is it so clear cut that this was a solicitation for murder? Was this a guy who was mixed up? Was he just trying to scare her? We, we have to try to understand it because it's ultimately the most bizarre case, maybe one of the most bizarre cases we've covered here on law and crime. And this guy, I'll tell you right now, 
He's not a likable defendant when he was on the stand. Yes, he gets up on the stand and, and, and he's rubbing people the wrong way. Look, even his new girlfriend, Valerie McDaniel, who was to become his co-defendant, but she committed suicide before the trial, she even said, apparently, well, when I first met him, I thought he was a slime bag. That's, that's not exactly what she said, but it's more or less what she said. I didn't like him. He put me off. He rubbed me the wrong way. But then once I got to know him, I thought he became a really, really nice guy, and then she fell head over heels for him. Her initial instinct was she didn't like him. But this guy thinks he can get in front of the jury and charm the jury by making sarcastic jabs back at the prosecutor's questions? Well, correct me if I'm wrong. Was it not the Bell's bondsman who said that it was like speaking to the devil himself when he spoke to Jacob? Which witness has come on the stand and has spoken favorably about this man? We had his ex-wife testify who said all crazy things about him as well and how violent he was. And then we'll know later on is that when his mother had a jailhouse conversation with him, she said, you can't keep your mouth shut, Leon. You don't know when to shut up. He's not a likable individual, and that matters in these kinds of cases. What the thing for me is, when I first read this case, I'm surprised that someone that educated, who was involved in the medical profession, would wind up like this. And we see it in terms of other kinds of professionals, like attorneys, who get mixed up in these kinds of things. You think people might know better, but unfortunately they don't. Well, look, I mean, so there's a personality trait that basically makes people talk. I mean, you and I talk a lot. We, we get paid to sit here and do it. Do we say you anything, know? though? No, no, <laughs> we speak about completely normal things. We analyze the cases. But, you know, look, Jacob is the kind of guy who just, as you said, doesn't know when to shut up. He does this interview with uh, 2020, a network TV huh? program, in jail waiting for trial. Does anybody believe him in that? Well, of course, it didn't get submitted into evidence, but look, um, he's talking to everybody. A part of me feels that he's also trying to get his story out in a way where he says, listen, I'm the victim here, okay? My heart was broken. My heart was broken. Megan and I broke well, up. Well, then walk away, find a new girlfriend, move on with your life. Did I mean, he do that? Cases, <laughs> too many of these cases start with this nexus that there's there's some breaking apart and you just want to look at the people in so many of the cases we cover here and say just walk away anyway we have to wrap up jesse weber great to have you as a guest today great being here it was an honor and i'm going to wrap up and sign off i think bob bianchi is going to be back on the flip side of the noon hour here so i appreciate being with you this morning here on law and crime along with your regular host jesse weber i'll see you next time